I always thought mindfulness was a bunch of woo-woo pseudoscience, but at today's podcast, Urologic Oncologist Dr. Phil Parazio convinces me otherwise, and he teaches us how we can start using it to make our lives better, starting now. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a show by me, Dr. Bradley Block, and this is a practical guide for practicing physicians where we interview experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. Dr. Phil Parazio, thanks for much for being on the podcast. Brad, absolute pleasure to be here with you. It's a long, a long time coming. We've been kind of bouncing in and out of each other's schedules, but we uh, we finally made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, two dads, two surgeons. It's uh, tough to line these things up sometimes, but here we are. Well, you're a logic oncologist. I, uh, calling me a surgeon is sometimes a bit of a stretch. You know, tonsils and adenoids and such. But but thank you. I appreciate I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So so your, your credentials. You know, I'm not sure we can we can trust you here. Med school at Columbia, residency at Hopkins, and now you're a full professor of surgery at Penn, section chief of urology at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center. And, you know, that sounds like a high powered academic. And and yet you made your your way into the mindfulness space, which seems, you know, it seems like these are almost anathema to each other. Right. Tell us about that juxtaposition. Yeah, it is a little bit of a juxtaposition. It just, say, you know, worked hard in my life, but very fortunate to be sometimes in the right place at the right time. And uh, things have worked out very well. Really happy with the new position at Penn and the opportunities that's afforded. But I think kind of along the path of academics and a lot of the work there, it can be incredibly rewarding, but you can also do, in retrospect, some really terrible things to yourself and sometimes people around you just by working really hard to be, quote unquote, successful in those traditional academic realms. And so, like everybody else, when COVID hit and I had some time to reflect, I wanted to sit down and think, what can I do to be better? And how can I be a better surgeon, a better husband, a better dad, you know, just better. And I started thinking about more than just the surgical aspects and academic aspects of my career and ended up settling on um, mindfulness. It just, it really resonated with me for a number of reasons. It created a platform that validated a lot of the really good behaviors and things I was doing, but then also allowed that foundation to build future direction where I wanted to go and, and really just resonated well with me personally. Let's start with a definition. What is, what is mindfulness? Yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a, so mindfulness gets thrown over all of the time and it's most often confused with specifically mindfulness meditation, kind of sitting legs crossed, you know, arms over your lap, eyes closed. And that is a form of mindfulness, but mindfulness basically means intentionally being in the moment kind of being really aware of what's going on around at you in, in the moment. And there are three components to truly being mindful. One is an intention or purposefully doing that. You just don't happen into this, that you, this is a thoughtful process. The second is really being present, kind of blocking out other distractions. And the last part of it is, is the most challenging, I think, but most important is being non-judgmental, kind of allowing things to be without passing judgment on yourself or what's going on around you. And those are the three key components of a mindful experience. Interesting. Interesting. So I was, I'm thinking like when we're in the operating room, right? That's kind of a good example of when we're in our, our flow state, which is a term that's bandied about, right? Cause you're really not thinking about anything else. You're just like thinking about like what's in front of you. What's your next step? What do you need to worry about? Right. You're Maybe operating with Zen, maybe not, but you're, you know, you're focused, but that doesn't incorporate the, I guess, non-judgmentalness and it doesn't incorporate the, well, sorry, just what were the, what were the three, the, the yeah. three keys again? Yeah, no, no it, it's, it's a great analogy. And when I speak about mindfulness in academic settings and such, you know, there's, there's skeptics and there's always skeptics and I welcome skepticism. And for all of the surgeons, I was telling them, there is no more mindful experience than an operation in an operating room when it's working well, right? Everybody in that operating room is intently focused on one patient, one problem, one moment. And that doesn't happen in every surgery and every minute of every surgery. But as you said, kind of analogous to a flow state, when things are working well, you're, you're in the moment. And the intention is there, right? For me, it could be a kidney tumor for you, an adenoid, as you measured, you know, you've set the intention, <laughs> you know, you're going after what, what you sought. 
the presence is tuning out everything else, not worrying about what happened before, what the next case is, what's happening tomorrow, but being in the moment with the patient. And the non-judgmentalness does come in, right? We're not perfect in the operating room. We may make mistakes. It doesn't mean a surgery goes wrong or there's a complication, but we may not have done something the way we wanted to do it. Or somebody may have handed us the wrong instrument or there's a distraction or, or going yeah, on. You so, throw a suture and you need to cut it out. Something simple like that. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. yeah stuff like and that happens not, all the time. Exactly. Not beating yourself up over it, not beating the disease state up over it. You know, oh, this is a terrible tumor. This is a terrible patient. I can't believe I'm doing this. Right. And that third part of it, of losing the judgment, just experiencing what is going on and moving in the correct direction is, is a really important part of it. I would argue that it's important to do that during office hours, right? Like you don't worry about the patient before, don't worry about the patient after, don't worry about the waiting room, don't worry about any pop-ups that are coming up as you're seeing the patient and documenting. But the more that you can be present with the patient, I think the faster the day goes in reality, but also, I mean, the faster the day seems to go, but the faster the day also does go because patients pick up on that. Patients pick up on your the fact that you're with them in this moment and not distracted with anything else. And then they often they recognize that and you're able to move through the visit faster because they don't repeat themselves because they know you heard. Now, sometimes they are distracted in, the, in themselves. Right. And they may not be picking up on the cues that you're providing that you are totally focused on them. And then they do. So it's not like it works like that 100 percent of the time, but often enough you enjoy the visits more and you're able to move through them faster. Yeah. And they're much more meaningful and efficient. And there's, there's two great examples from that. It, and one is there's actually medical literature here and there's something called, you know, kind of perceived time. And when you sit down with a patient, push the computer out of the way, look them in the eye, really listen to them. You may actually spend three minutes with them, but they perceive it as 10 or 15 minutes. Whereas you could spend 10 minutes with somebody, but if you're staring at your computer, clicking away and never making eye contact with them, you know, they think you gave them 30 seconds and that's well reflected in press Ganey scores or whatever ratings your hospital or system is using. That's well represented in the, in the medical literature. And the other part of that is we all know my clinic runs pretty efficiently, but we all have partners or colleagues or mentors whose clinics run incredibly behind schedule. I mean, talking hours behind schedule, but patients line up to see them because they know when it's their time, they're getting 150% of Dr. So-and-so. They know that that doc is totally into them and they're worth bringing their book and their Sudoku or whatever it is to sit in the waiting room and wait to see Dr. So-and-so because they're going to get everything that doctor has when it is their time. Then there are the doctors who run really behind that don't necessarily do that. Um, and if there, are any, if there are any listeners out there who actually have insight into the common practices of doctors who run behind and what they can do differently, I would be very interested. Not that I run behind, but it's something that I'm, I'm working on as kind of a side project on how to run efficiently for people who don't necessarily run so efficiently. Yeah. So hey, just listen, we all you know, run make sure behind. to email me. Yeah. You know, it happens to all of us, but we all do. sometimes it happens to the same people over and over, right? Like, like you said, they know the patients know it's going to be a long rate. And sometimes it's because they have the patient's undivided attention and they let the patient take their time. Sometimes there may be other things involved. And that's what I want to figure Correct. out. So sorry to take things away from uh, mindfulness for, no. for a moment there. But, uh, you know, there, we, no. can always, we can always do better. So I want to find out what those habits are that can help yeah. us. No, but know, Brad, but you're, you're not taking away from it. It's actually a really important part of kind of the intentional practice of it, right? If you have so many hours in your clinic and you book, you know, 50 patients in it, you can't intentionally give those patients your best self, right? You are intentionally telling them you're going to get a little bit of me and I'm just going to turn through as many patients as possible. And you'll get much more efficient practices at it. And one of the suggestions I've worked with people on is, so let's say you want to see somebody every three months and your clinic just can't handle it. You don't have that volume capability, but you have phenomenal partners or APPs. Well, yeah, it's hard to get rid of your patients and you really build a, a bond with them, but say, listen, I can't see you in three months. I'm going to see you in six months. It reduces 50% of your clinic flow and just say, listen, one of my partners can see you or one of the APPs can see you. If there's a problem, of course I'll see you, but if everything's smooth, check in with them in three months and come see me in six months. 
or if it was a six month interval, see them in a year. You've decreased 50% of your clinic volume. You're giving people 50% more of your attention and things run much more efficiently. So you can intentionally set yourself up to be more mindful with your patients. Now, has that also made its way into your home life? Yeah, it is. And part of the reason you and I have had such a hard time connecting is that we really carve out time and space for our families. And when I'm at work, I work really hard and I give everything I have. And when I'm home, I give my kids and my wife everything I've got. And I try really to keep the phone and the emails away. I try not to schedule nighttime meetings. And my hey, colleagues wait, know that. This is nighttime. Hey, What's going it's, on? It, it's, we, we got the books in. We got shower time done already. We right, make all adjustments. Right. All right. We intentionally make adjustments. I right? appreciate that. Yeah. But these are important conversations too, right? And we're you know working towards our fulfillment by kind of chatting together about these things. This podcast is sponsored by Doc to Doc Lending, the personal lending platform for doctors by doctors. Traditional lenders overestimate the risk of lending to doctors because a lot of us carry significant debt. But at Doc to Doc, they know that as a profession, doctors almost never default on their loans, and they take that in consideration when they're setting our rates. I love what Doc to Doc is doing within our community, so please check them out at Doc to Doc Lending dot com slash pgtd that's doc to doc lending number two slash pgtd for physician's guide to doctoring yeah i find for myself that's always been my like new year's resolution right i'm going to be more mindful of my time with my kids and you know the the advice that i always hate because it's not really advice is oh it goes so fast it goes so fast and one way that you can slow down time is being mindful and not being distracted and not thinking about other things, to be there with your kids in their activities. And then it makes it more memorable, right? It's more likely to become an indelible memory than if you were distracted by your phone or thinking about work or your podcast or something. But it's always a struggle. Like, I always have to remind myself. I mean, have you come up with any tips or tricks to, you yeah. know, to not um, have to keep reminding yeah. myself? Well, for, for those of us who have kids as a constant reminder, kids are incredibly insightful and will tell you. And you'd be like, hey, I was at my eight-year-old's tennis lesson today. And I can tell you, if she saw me looking at my phone, she'd let me know after. You know, I'd be like, oh, I saw your, your forehand was great today. And she's like, how do you know? You're looking at your phone. <laughs> you know, I mean, they pick up on these things and, and they'll tell you. So ask your kids sometimes. And I guess a, one of the things that's really important in this in kind of a mindfulness practice is identifying stakeholders, right? And at work, this can be partners or your administrators or whoever it may be, your boss. And at home, it's your wife and your kids and your family and check in with them. You know, you kind of set the intention, set the intention with your wife and say, hey, listen, you know, I want to be more present for you and the kids. And every couple of weeks, hey, how am I doing? You know, I said I wanted to do this. You think I'm doing a good job? And my wife tells me when I'm not, whether I want to or not sometimes, <laughs> but uh, she, she tells me and she keeps me honest. And she says, yeah, some days you're doing good and some days you're not. Excuse me. And I think the, the other thing that really helps is I've started kind of, I just take five or 10 minutes before I go to bed at night and I have a little journal book that I, that I keep at the side of the bed. And I do three things every night before I go to bed. One is I just write down one to three things that happen throughout the day that I'm grateful for. And they're often really simple things. The second thing I do is one to three things that have to be done the next day. For instance, tomorrow I'm given a lecture at NYU and I've got a doctor's appointment myself. Those two things have to happen. The rest of the stuff throughout the day may happen. It may not happen, but those are two priority things that have to happen or the day's not successful. And it helps alleviate a lot of the anxiety and stress about all of the other stuff going on in your life. You can identify what has to happen. And then the last part is, you know, I give myself the opportunity to reflect on, on things for the day. If I want to write about good, bad, ugly thoughts, whatever it may be, it gives the opportunity to do that. And I find those three things allow you to be reduce a lot of anxiety about the next day. It gets you kind of prepared for it and keeps you intentional. All right, when I wake up in the morning, I don't need to think about what the important things are about the day. I've already thought at the, about them and wrote them down before I went to bed. So I know what I need to do tomorrow. So I'm not going to stress about it. And it allows the day to function a little more efficiently and it allows you to wake up and have breakfast with the kids, help them get them off to school because you're not worried about, you know, what you need to do. You've already thought that out. I like that. I like that. You know, there's always journal, keep a gratitude. Like I, we tried, my wife and I tried gratitude thing and it just like, it just kind of petered out. And, you know, I heard, you know, Tim Ferriss has been all about journaling for a while. I've been listening to his podcast and 
no, maybe five years. Maybe he's not into journaling anymore. You know, these things have been have been talked about, but I like how you have just like just one thing, one thing, and one thing. Like it just simplifies it so much. And yeah, it's like the New Year's more resolution. More likely to keep right? it if it's simpler. You know, if you lower the bar, you're more likely to do it. Correct. And you'll find that if you really like it, you may expand things out and you may take it in a different direction. And you know, the, and the key is keeping up the the good habit. So I also have a rule. Listen, I'm not perfect. This weekend we were visiting my in-laws. We were having a good time. I didn't journal on Saturday night. It's okay. It's not the end of the world, but I tried not to miss Sunday, right? Because then it breaks the habit. So, you know, small steps, little successes go a long way. And, uh, you know, be thoughtful about what you want to do and what direction you want to move in. So you hear the word mindfulness gets you thinking of the whole wellness space. And that is a space that's with pseudoscience, right? Like, how do you prevent yourself from moving from mindfulness into like recommending Reiki for your patients? Okay, maybe not that far, maybe not that far. But like, how do you distinguish the benefits from the buzzwords? Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. And as I said, I you know I actually I don't know if it's a comment on uh, the my actual academic work or that people are really interested in this mindfulness space. But I get asked to lecture a lot more on mindfulness now than I do on cancers, which is okay with me. It makes the conversations really interesting and interactive. But one of the ways I, I start that conversation, because I'm usually in a room full of surgeons, is that we're so trained and ingrained that things have to be black and white and there has to be science and you have to have hard proof. And when there is proof and when there is science, I show it and I make it available to people because I think it's an incredibly powerful tool, especially to help surgeons and skeptics and scientists who think critically about these things understand that there are tangible benefits and where you can measure those benefits. But I also say to people that there's a lot of gray here. And if we can just change your perception so that you feel better about your day, you feel better at the end of your week, you feel better taking care of patients, you feel better kind of at the end of the year, then we're doing something good because the opposite, the burnout and the stress and the toxicity that people are feeling are just crushing the medical field right now and crushing surgeons. And so I, I do say that where there is science and where there is facts and where there's data, I will show it to you. But if we can change the way you think and feel on a daily basis about yourself and what you're doing, then we're making a tremendous impact. So there's some science in there. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. There's some, there's some, okay, so let's hear it. These are, you know, the physicians we're speaking to. Not necessarily yeah. all surgeons, but we're all physicians. So let's hear some, let's hear some data. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is, there's absolutely science and, you know, on mindfulness meditation alone, there's science that talks about blood pressure and heart rate. There's a lot of studies in cardiovascular disease. So you can look at, at, at some of that in the physician realm. There are uh, a number of studies, simple studies that basically show physicians who are trained kind of in mindfulness techniques had better patient scores and better patient satisfaction scores, better interactions with their patients. There's a, actually a number of studies in the surgery realm, particularly at a UCSF. There's a general surgeon named Carter Labaris who's really interested in mindfulness, and she's randomized surgical residents to mindfulness-based training, basically modified some of the mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques into surgical training and has shown not only objective improvements in scores and stress and emotional capabilities, but they've even done some basic science work where they're showing down regulation and kind of stress pathways in some of these residents. So the, the science is growing and it's not strong. These are not New England Journal of Medicine articles, but it's also not pseudoscience. And the data is building that there are tangible benefits in a lot of these realms. Are they defining mindfulness in the same way as you? Yeah. So these are actually protocol studies where there are didactics and at least in, in Dr. Labaris's work where there are protocol studies, specific training regimens that the residents and other surgeons go through. So yeah, it is, uh, it's objective or as objective as you can be. Yeah. Well, I, I'm thinking like sleep apnea, where it's hard to compare studies because, oh. you know, you define success, even defining like, was the surgery successful? You know, now they're more standardized, but but originally, like, how do you define sleep apnea? Interestingly, Aetna doesn't even define sleep apnea the same way as Cigna and Medicare doesn't define it the same. So, like, I would think something that's a little more difficult to define is going to be harder to standardize across studies. 
Yeah. And some of these outcomes, uh, to the researchers credit, they use the objective measures that you can use. So existing yeah. questionnaires about stress and emotional response and they, they, they did not create their own, uh, their own criteria let's put it that way no but like the three tenets of mindfulness are oh yeah the same oh, yeah. in each okay that that is the basics that comes from a guy named john kabat zinn who is basically the founder of mindfulness-based stress reduction and kind of credited with the western movement of mindfulness in, in this country at least what are the roots of the mindfulness movement like do they come from stoic philosophy or eastern yeah. you know where are they yeah, all of the above. And that's one of okay. my favorite things to do is, is talk about it. You know, it, it gets credited mostly to Eastern philosophy, you know, Buddhism and, and Hindu practices, you know, Zen Buddhism, you know, through Japan. But really the principles of mindfulness exist in our Western philosophies in ancient Greece and Rome. I mean, it basically is consistent throughout human nature and human society is this concept of mindfulness and being in the moment. And it's, it's one of my favorite, you know, stories to, to share is kind of about religion. And if you, if you take religion, all of the religions at their basis, they're trying to get you to be present, to be in the moment, whether you're Catholic or Jewish or, or Muslim, whatever it is, it's about being in the moment and being present, whether it's in the presence of God, whoever that God is. And what's beautiful about who we are is that we all have that same kind of goal, despite all of the diverse thoughts that bring us there. And so it really is a way to kind of think that we are all unified despite our different backgrounds and, and thoughts. And it's interesting that our brain is not designed to do that. Our brain is designed for threat detection. What might happen tomorrow? What might be over that hill? Not what I'm looking at right now. So it's, it's an uphill battle. It is a huge uphill battle. And you're right. Evolutionarily, we were made to fight stress, right? To to recognize what was a threat to our existence. And it sends off all of these signals that raise your blood pressure and your heart rate and all of those things. And a lot of the mindfulness practices are rooted in slowing all of those processes down, moving from that central kind of older brain of ours back out to the cognitive and saying, okay, I'm experiencing an elevated heart rate and increased breathing. Is there really a threat going on or am I just perceiving something? And once you're able to kind of understand and get a little bit of body and mind awareness, it becomes a lot easier to control those things. And that's an incredibly powerful skill. And I work a lot with our, our young surgeons on that, especially when something's going bad in the operating room. All right, slow down. Your heart rate just went up. You're breathing fast. That's a lot of blood. Slow down, right? You can, is it a threat to you? No, it's a threat to this person. Let's figure out how we're going to do this safely and, and help that person out. Yeah. Yeah. And then you know, the perceived threat versus the real threat and, and what you can control versus what you can't control, right? There's some things like worrying about the uncontrollable. There's no benefit. There's, there are only things that you can, that are within your control. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. So do you have any, any brass tax advice for our listeners? You just gave us some good, good stuff actually with, uh, with what you journal at night, but, uh, anything else or something surgeons and non-surgeons alike can start doing tomorrow? Yeah, I think one of the easiest things to do is just think about who you want to be. And there's a couple of techniques and, and little exercises you can take yourself through. But importantly is the act of actually writing these things down. And whether you like to do it pen and paper, that's how I like to do it. But you like to type on a computer, that's fine too. But put down kind of what are your values? Think about you know who your heroes are. What kind of person do you want to be? And are you doing things on a daily, you know, weekly basis? that allow you to be that person you want to be or move towards that. And we're never perfect. We're never going to be perfect on every day. We're never going to, you know, never necessarily going to achieve the ideal of what we want to be, but we certainly can move in that direction and just setting up an intention moving forward purposefully, I think gives us a lot of direction and lowers a lot of the anxieties that come with being a crazy human. Like we all are. Great. That's awesome. I love that. Tell us about Operate with Zen. Tell us about your podcast. Yeah, thanks. So Operate with Zen started once again through COVID a couple of years ago. And it was literally, I sat down and I was really getting into this mindfulness stuff because I had nothing else to do like the rest of us. I was, I was locked down and I already had a Peloton, so I had plenty of uh, uh, physical stuff to do. And I said, I, I, I need to start putting these thoughts down for me 
you know, I just need to start cataloging these thoughts I have and, and these mindfulness concepts and how they apply to surgery and how they can help the next surgeon. And it made sense to do it in kind of an audio way so I could just talk through it. And I said, you know what, why don't I come up with a podcast? And if it helps one other person, then it was worth me recording it. And it turns out it's helping more than more than one other person. Uh, a lot of people are listening and uh, I appreciate everybody who has. And it's been a really rewarding experience. And one of the things I, I really look forward to doing, you know, it started as me kind of monologuing about some of these mindfulness concepts. And I learned quickly that uh, people didn't want to hear me monologuing. <laughs> they were getting a lot more out of some of the conversations like you and I are having right now about what it means to be a surgeon and a physician and how these principles of mindfulness, no matter how we approach them, can be applied to our lives and, and help us be better people and be better humans. And so it's been incredibly rewarding, got to meet incredible people around the world, like-minded and skeptical and people who are way out there and, and really successful by all measures, people who are really struggling, people who you think are really successful but are really struggling. I mean, it's just a, it's an incredible group of people when you start actually talking about this stuff, which we don't do a lot in surgery. Uh, it's incredible what you learn about others. Give us one or two lessons that you've learned from your guests. Give us give us a little taste of what we're going to hear on on Operate with Zen. Yeah, yeah. So we we I always try and start with kind of people's personal story and how they got into surgery and how they got into mindfulness if they're a mindful person. And I think one of the things I've learned uh, throughout and that we're actually focusing on in our next season is vulnerability, and it's one of the things not only do we not usually express in surgery, we're often taught not to express vulnerability. But what I've learned from all of my guests is when we get the most out of each other is when we're with the, the most vulnerable. We talk about the deep, dark moments, whether it's a complication or issues we've been having personally or the struggles we've felt despite growing our CV and getting promoted, that it's not always easy. And being vulnerable and sharing those vulnerabilities, those kind of the soft undersides, I think is really, really powerful. And that's definitely something I take home from every guest. And the second thing, we also try and make it incredibly practical. You know, we're clinicians, we're, we're surgeons in, in, in general, and we want to go home with something tangible that we can actually do to improve our lives. So whether it's habit formation or it's journaling or it's dealing with a complication or dealing with a family after complications. I and mean, we try and come up with some real clinical pearls in every episode as well so that you have something tangible to go home with. Do you ever talk about this stuff with your patients? So some of them have listened to the podcast and, and they do. And some of them will really say, you know, oh, I really appreciate what you're doing in the space. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that. I mean, I think it's a little bit of a self-selecting phenomenon. I think the people who probably think I'm crazy go see my partners, but, uh, but yeah, I, I do get good feedback from the patients about it. And I think, I think, you know, the, the old mantra that, oh, it didn't matter if that surgeon, well, first of all, it was always, it doesn't matter if he's an a-hole, right? He's a good surgeon. That's not acceptable anymore, right? Uh, it's just not. There are plenty of people who are technically gifted surgeons. And the beauty of this and now, it's men and women. It's people of all different colors and backgrounds. It's not that classic Halsteadian white male in this country who could be a jerk. And it's not acceptable to be a jerk and people don't want that anymore. They want someone who's going to take care of them with their technical skills by being a human, by taking them through some of the, the tougher challenges of their life. I mean, it takes, I, I have a surgery upcoming and I do surgery weekly, almost daily. It is daunting to think about somebody putting you to sleep and cutting into your body. Yeah. It's a big deal. And there's... You know, there's the, the technical side of it and there's all the space, we call it now the space in between technique on the show. You know, what are all the things we're talking about between sutures and between needle drivers and what we're using? How do you figure all of that out and how do you take really good care of people? So I love it. I love it. Okay. So where can people find you online? Where can they find you on social media, on Operate With Zen? Yeah, Operate With Zen's basically on every major podcast channel. Um, you can find it on iTunes. You can find it on Spotify. It's hosted on Buzzsprout, but you can find it once again just about anywhere. I'm on Twitter, Dr. Phil underscore urology, real clever name. Uh, I used to joke <laughs> that I had more hair than him, but I'm not sure I do anymore. But uh, yeah, Dr. Phil underscore urology, you can find me at the University of Pennsylvania Presbyterian Medical Center up in the west side of Philly. Great, great little hospital and a big medical center. So yeah, I'm out there. Happy to chat with any of you. 
And just to summarize, let's go through, I want to just go through two of your points one more time. One, what were those three tenets of mindfulness? Yeah, intention, presence, and being not judgmental. That last one, that's hard. That's, <laughs> that's going to be hard for and, me. Yeah, Come from and, a and long line you, of judgmental people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and where it's easy to make progress is being non judgmental with others, right? We can give people gracious excuses. It's really, really hard to do it to ourselves yeah. and to not judge ourselves. That's the really challenging one. But like everything else with practice, you, you get there. And then what were those three things that you write in your journal before bed? Yeah. So one to three things that I'm grateful for that happened in the last 24 hours, one to three things that have to happen the next day, musts for the next day, not maybes, musts. And then I give myself an opportunity to reflect good, bad thoughts I may be having, something I want to just kind of get out. And it gives an opportunity to just kind of think for a little. And get it out of your head and get it onto the paper. I'm sure it helps yeah. you get to sleep too. It helps a ton. <laughs> well, Dr. Phil underscore urology. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Phil Parazio, thank you so much for your time. And everyone, check out Operate with Zen. Brad, an absolute pleasure being with you. Thanks for the time. I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks for listening to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast player. I'm also available for medical legal consulting and keynote speaking if you're interested, or to just give us some feedback on the show, email me at brad at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com. I'll see you next week. The ideas expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers.